hospital was just a passing price. When I talk about the flood, damage that's down through the center of Louisiana, uh, that roof area has been hit especially hard. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, Christian brethren in that area that's lost just about everything. Uh, they're getting help from a lot of places. The uh, uh, relief effort from the church in Tennessee has spent help, I know that. And uh, some of the congregation from maybe this area, Mount Pleasant, Mount Vernon, are helping. And it is our intent to uh, send money. They need money more than anything else right now. Uh, they don't have their houses prepared for furniture or things like that. There's no place to put it. So uh, they need, they've got more need for money to buy the supplies that they need uh, right now. And they, at a time goes by, another few days, they'll have, uh, they can use body people to do things and clean up the houses and that sort of thing. But after a flood like that, you've got to wait till the water goes down before you can start. But we're going to send money probably tomorrow. If you want to send uh, a special contribution, and send that to uh, uh, that room area to help with the flood. If you'll give that to uh, some of us today, give it to Dave or one of the elders, get it, uh, we will get that money sent probably tomorrow. So today, any time today or tonight, if you want if you choose to do that, the money will be well spent in that room area. Today, good news. Hot luck. That's always a good day when we have hot luck. We'll have a hot luck lunch in the back. Immediately after this service, we want everybody to stay. We'll have plenty. And uh, we encourage you to participate in that. And there's going to be a girls' day in Hope, Arkansas, at the Church of Christ, on September the 10th. It'll be from 9 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. Sounds like lunch is in there fun to me. If you want to go, please pre-register. There's more information about this activity on the bulletin board. It is our plan to send the van if we have enough people that want to go. But this is a girl's day. I thought it said something about the age, but it's probably on the bulletin board. I will try to get what that one. That'll give you something to look for when you get to the bulletin board. And next Sunday, one week from today, we will have a youth devotional here at the building. And please see Mary Nan for what to bring. So we have a youth devotional next Sunday. Evening after the service, and Mary Lynn knows what will be needed for that to see her about what she can bring. Before our opening prayer, we'll sing Psalm number 774. 774. Sing all three verses. <laughs> oh, thou blessed rock of ages, the ages I have come, sing now, Lord, in me. He
Compare our minds to the Lord's Supper. We'll sing song number 315. 315. Shh. When I serve you. Thank you. 
Brother Sofline from the Lovely Silva. Father, at this time, we protect this fruit of vine that represents his shed blood on the cross. It will do so in a plain manner, except for an outside. In the cross, name of the Christ, amen.
turn to you to tell you how much we appreciate you. Many blessings of this life, Lord, both physical and spiritual. We thank you for our, our homes, our jobs, and the things that you provide for us. But we, have, we know that everything comes from you. Lord, as we take this time to give back a portion, we ask that we do so in a manner pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Song number 912 is our song in the session. 912. And after the session, we're song number 429. Let's all be singing. Sing all three verses of this song, and we'll have our lesson. 429.
It will be after services, and it will be here at the building. And to see Mary Lynn, that is my Mary Lynn, Mary Lynn Cawley. We have another Mary Lynn in the congregation here. <laughs> we don't want you to go to her. We want you to go to Mary Lynn Cawley uh, about the food arrangements for that youth devotional. You probably already understood that, but I just wanted to be clear just in case so that uh, you can uh, see the right person. And uh, I think we're going we're gonna to have a brisket. I'm going to cook a brisket next weekend. I think that sounds good to me. What do you think? All right. So uh, now if you're not, if you're not uh, in the youth group, you can't come. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but we do have potluck today, so you come to that. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's uh, be planning for that uh, youth event. Uh, next week. And then also, the uh, I wanted to uh, mention about the flood. Uh, I was asked by the elders to, to make a few statements about that. Uh, we know that there is some congregations down in South Louisiana. I know of at least three that I can think of that are probably coordinating relief efforts and different matters such as that. The information that I have received right now is that they need money and they need and the reason why they need money is because there were so this flood it went higher than they thought it was going to go it went into areas that have never been flooded before and a lot of people did not have flood insurance uh, to cover the flood because they thought they were out of the flood plane, you know and as a result of this flooding that they have you know, lost everything, um, if, you know, in the houses and all of that. So they're going to have to have that completely replaced. All the carpets are going to need to be pulled up, and they won't have any money to uh, to cover that because they didn't have the flood insurance. So, so that they need money, and that's the biggest thing that they need right now. There is there is uh, a couple of organizations that are working to bring immediate relief, water, and uh, food, and things of that nature. One of them is out of Florida, and there's another one out of Tennessee. But the one I, I know about the one out of Florida where they're going. I don't know where the one in Tennessee is going that, that Brother uh, Shelton mentioned. But the one out of Florida, it's called Disaster Assistance. And they come out of Florida and they are working with the Goodwood congregation in Baton Rouge, Louisiana right now, I believe. And uh, the gentleman who is working with that has uh, set up, it. I'm trying to remember his name, Mike, oh, his name is Mike Baumgartner, Mike Baumgartner. And he has set up his, what he does at the Goodwood congregation in Baton Rouge and uh, he is currently distributing meals and he sends out daily Facebook reports on that. Uh, if you would like more information about that, see me later and I'll get you connected with him. But he's doing immediate aid type relief like giving water and food and things like that. Um, the Gonzales congregation is a congregation in South Louisiana that is to the, the south of Baton Rouge. And they were hit really hard by the flood. I received a report from the preacher there. And he says that they had several members that did not have flood insurance and were flooded out. And so that congregation can use some money. Uh, there's also the Chalmette congregation. They're closer to New Orleans than they are to Baton Rouge, but you know that's all kind of in the same area. I don't know how much the Chalmette congregation is doing, uh, but those are the three congregations that I know of and what their involvement is at this time. Again, I think the best thing at this point would be to uh, make some uh, cash donations to them and it's probably going to be significant. They're probably, going to, they're probably going to need a significant amount of money to help them recover, especially from the flooding that has taken these houses when they didn't have insurance, you know. You know how much it costs to furnish a house and to, to re-carpet a house and repaint a house and all that. So, uh, you know, just 
five or six of those could run into a lot of money. But, um, but I know there's a lot of congregations participating in raising funds for those areas. And we know some very good places to send that money to. So, um, and I, I would trust these congregations uh, completely with overseeing those funds and with really uh, doing a good job in, in using those funds in the right way. All right. Well, the last thing I wanted to talk about on a little more happier note, and I say happier note because it might be happier for some and not as happy for others. And you say, well, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about back to school. <laughs> and now you understand why I said that. Uh, because school starts tomorrow. And that is a wonderful thing, and we're so excited about that. I know the kids may not be as excited as us adults. The teachers, I know, have been working and preparing, and we're so thankful for them, and we're excited for them to start a new school year. And um, we have so many teachers and uh, school professionals in our congregation here, and even retired individuals who were teachers for years. And I thought it would be appropriate to have a, a moment of prayer on their behalf and just pray for the teachers and the students in the school year. So would you back in prayer at this time? Heavenly Father, we, we love you so much, and we thank you for all the good blessings of life. And we're so grateful, Father, for our children and what they mean to us and the blessing that they are to our lives. And Father, as they start a new school year tomorrow here in New Boston and Sims and Hooks and other places, Father, we Malta and all the different congregations and all the different schools in our community. Father, we, we ask your blessings upon them and we pray, Father, that you give them a good safe year. Help our children to really learn and to really grow this year so that they can uh, become wonderful adults who will participate in the community and who will really give back and help others. Father, we, we're grateful for our teachers and our administrators and all of those who participate in the schools in our area. And we thank you, Father, for each one of them and they are so special to us. Father, we ask your blessings upon their work. They're doing very good work, and they're doing your work, Father, as they help these children to learn and to grow, and to learn what it means to be a good citizen, and to really uh, participate in the community. Father, we're thankful for them, and we ask your blessings upon them at each and every moment of this year. Help it to be a good year for them, Help it to be a safe year for them. And Father, we pray that you would keep Satan away from all the things that he does and seeks to do among uh, the schools. And we just ask, Father, that you would keep him out of our schools and that you would defeat him and all the, the evil intentions that he has. And that, Father, you would, you would bless our schools and that you would be present in our schools. And we just pray, Father, that that you would do the good work that you can do with them, that we know you can do, Father. Uh, and we ask, Father, that as uh, we contemplate all these things, that as uh, your people, that we would let our lights shine in the ways that we can let those lights shine, Father, and that we would be able to really help others come to know about you and about your Son, Jesus the Christ. And it's in the, and Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well we've had a few moments of announcements that we needed to talk about. But let's go ahead and get into our lesson today. And we're going to continue some of the thoughts that we started a couple of weeks ago. When we started discussing the concept of encouragement and discouragement. And we want to think about overcoming discouragement. That's what we've been thinking about for the past couple of weeks. And in Philippians chapter 4 and verses 4 and following, the Apostle Paul writes some wonderful words of encouragement. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do. And the God of peace will be with you. So some wonderful words of encouragement from the Apostle Paul. Remember that the basic assumption in this passage is that we have the ability to control our thoughts, and to control our emotions, and to control our feelings. Now, the Apostle Paul wouldn't have written the things that he wrote here if that wasn't true. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. God isn't going to give us a commandment that we can't obey. He's not going to tell us something that's impossible to do and expect us to do it when we can't do it. God tells us to rejoice, and that means that we can rejoice in every circumstance, in every situation that we're in. Because that emotion, that ability to have joy within our life is under our control. We're not supposed to be anxious for, for anything. We're not supposed to worry, but we're supposed to commit those things to God in prayer. And God promises to give us His peace. The peace that passes all understanding. And notice the control that we have over our thoughts as well. In verse 8, He says, Think about these things, the true things, the noble things, the just things, the pure things, the lovely things, the things that are of good report, virtuous things, praiseworthy things. We are to meditate on these things. Yes, we can control our thoughts. We can control our emotions. And it's with that in mind that we began this series of lessons on overcoming discouragement. Because so many times discouragement happens as a result of our own thoughts, as a result of our own emotions, as a result of our own feelings, the things that we have some control over. But the, the lie that Satan wants us to believe is that we don't have any control over those things. They just happen to us. And that we can't control what we think and that we can't control what we feel. And that's all out of our control. And so, and we just become a big emotional wreck, you see. But God is saying, no, no, that's not true. You have control over those things. You can think what you want to think. And you can feel what you want to feel if you will think about the right things. And if you will believe the right things. And concentrate and meditate, as the Apostle Paul says, then you can have some control over your life. And you know what? When we have some control over our life, and over ourself in particular, that makes everything so much more better. It makes everything so much more bright. It makes everything so much more enjoyable because we don't feel like we're just constantly at the uh, the beck and call of, of, of all of the things that are going on around us constantly out of control of ourselves, you see. And when, when we, we're, we feel like we're out of control, that is discouraging. That is, that is uh, depressing even at times. But when we feel like we're in control, and God gives us that control, you see, then we can feel better about ourselves, and we can know a little bit more about ourselves, and we can really feel uh, positive about our life. Now, we talked about some things that we need to do in order to overcome discouragement. The first thing we talked about was taking ownership of our life. And we have to take ownership of our life, and we really got to accept who we are, the choices that we've made, the decisions that we've made, and the consequences from those choices and those decisions, okay? And the first thing, in order to take ownership of our life, the first thing we've got to do is stop blaming everyone and everything else for the things that we've actually done, the things that we believe, the things that we felt, the things that we thought, okay? 
The second thing we need to do is realize that any problems that I have are my problems and accept those problems and really uh, go ahead and say, yes, you know, I accept that. I, I, I did it. I did it to myself. Whatever it might be, a thought that we've had, a feeling that we've had, a belief that we've had, whatever it might be. And then we can give those things to God, you see, because when we really accept the problems that we've created, we can really give them to God. You can't give something to God that you haven't accepted yet, can you? And so if you give it to God, He can really take it away from you, but you've got to accept it before you can give it to Him. If you're rejecting it, if, if, it's your, if it's a problem that you've created and that you, you've made, and you're pushing it out there and you're saying, you know what, I, I don't accept that, well then you can't give it to God so He can really take it away from you, and it's going to be with you, it's going to stay with you. Because you created it. You made it. Alright? But when we accept it, when we say, yes, you know what, I did this, I did it to myself, then we can finally give it to God and He will take it away from us and He will forgive us for all the horrible things that we've done in life. And He will take those things away from us and He will replace all the bad feelings that we have within our life with the good feelings of peace and joy and love. Now, He can do that. Okay? He can really do that. And He can make a difference in our life. And so the first thing we need to do is take ownership of our life. And last week we stopped talking about the second thing. And that's stop trying to be someone that we are not. Stop trying to be someone that we are not. And sometimes we get discouraged because we fall into a false identity. And we try to be someone that we are not. And this false identities can be found in a lot of things, beauty, wealth, sex, power, intelligence, and a lot of other things. And those are just a few. But when we fixate on those things and make those things our desire, they can become a false identity. And it's, uh, it, 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 it puts us in a position of doing something that's impossible, trying to be something that we're not. And when we try to do something that's impossible, we're always going to fail. And that's discouraging. Well, pride is the problem to overcome here because our pride attaches itself to things that it shouldn't attach itself to. And uh, as, a, as a result, our pride blinds us and pushes God out of our lives and we become discouraged because of that. The solution to that is to identify with Jesus. That's who we really need to identify with. God made him the second Adam. He is our standard, our model, our example. And when we identify with Him, we can really be the kind of people that God wants us to be. And we can be the person that God created us to be by identifying with Jesus. And so, it, to overcome discouragement, the second thing we need to do is to stop trying to be someone that we're not. Now, the third thing this morning, to overcome discouragement... And this has to happen after these other two things happen. You can't really do this third one until you've done the first two. So these really go in order. You've got to take ownership of your life, first of all. Secondly, you've got to stop trying to be someone that you're not. And then now third, you need to give yourself away to others. Give yourself away to others. And what am I talking about when I'm talking about giving yourself away to others? Well... First of all, when we think about this, we recognize our value, our worth. How much we're really worth to God. And you remember that Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verses 18 and 19, that you are worth the blood of the Son of God. You weren't redeemed with gold and silver, okay? You're not that cheap. You're much more valuable than that. But with precious blood, as the lamb without spot and without blemish. That's how valuable you are. Now you need to tell yourself that every day. When you wake up and you stand in front of the me me mirror every morning, you need to look at yourself and you need to tell yourself you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and that's how valuable you are. And, and you say that to yourself every day. And that will really give you a sense of self-worth that uh, God really does give you. All right? But when you, when you understand your self-worth and your value... Uh, you, you will want to give yourself away to others. You'll really want to be involved in other people's lives. You'll really want to participate 
in, in other activities and, and things that other people do, all right? Because you'll understand that you're worth something and that you're worth something to God and so you're worth something to other people as well. And so you can give yourself away and really uh, make a difference in other people's lives. Now, the reason we don't give ourselves away so many times to others that are around us is because we're too focused upon ourselves and our own problems. And we're too busy thinking about uh, how worthless we really are. And a lot of us think like this on a daily basis. Well, we think, well, I'm really no good. I can't really do anything. I can't really help anybody else. And so I might as well just stay here at home and not do anything at all. And that's how a lot of people think about their life. And some of us think that way about our life. But look, this is this is the kind of thinking that Satan wants you to do. Not God doesn't want you to think like this. Satan wants you to think like this. Now look at James chapter 3 and verses 14 through 16 for just a moment. James chapter 3 and verses 14 through 16 because James talks about this this uh, devilish kind of thinking that um, that Satan wants you to think about. And he, he tells us not to think that way. Look at James chapter 3, starting in verse 14. He says, But if you have bitter envy, and listen to this, and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Self-seeking. Wow. That's, you know, a lot of us do that. We seek ourself. And, and we're just look, looking after self and self alone. And, and we think about self so much. And God doesn't want us to do that. He, he doesn't want us to think about ourself in terms of just thinking about, you know, what my problems are and my needs are and what I need and what I want and what I can do and this, that, and the other. He wants us to think about others first and really make that transition in our thoughts from thinking about self to thinking about others. Now that, that can be a challenge, but God can help us with that if we'll do it. And so in order to give yourself away to others, the first step that you've got to make is really thinking about others in your own mind really starting to think about other people and what they are doing and what they are experiencing and what they are participating in. That's the first step that needs to be made. It's a mental move, okay? Now, when we just focus on self and all of our own problems and all the things that, that we think need to be done and, and that I think uh, are right and I, I think this and I think that and I think that you should do this and I think you should do that, when we're thinking like that, we're really in a bad place because that's self-seeking, okay? But we can move away from that by really opening up our eyes. You know, opportunities like this flood that's happened in South Louisiana really give us an opportunity to open our eyes to the plight of other people, okay? And we really need to look at those things and we really need to think about those things and what's going on in the lives of others. We really need to think about, you know, the, the school year that's starting up and the kids that are going to school and our teachers and the things that they're going to be going through as they uh, go to school. Let's think about those things. Uh, let's think about our youth here at the congregation what we can do to help them and support them and love them and all the things that we do. And the church really does help you get out of your own head, okay? And what I mean by that is that it provides you a context in which to come together and to look at other people and to really try to learn and discover what's going on within their lives. Because that's what we need to do. Now the church can help us with that. And the church can help us to do that so that we're not constantly so caught up within our own head and within our own thoughts that all we think about is self and have that kind of self-centeredness and self-thinking. Look back to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Or, uh, yeah, for just a moment. We were in Philippians 2 in our Bible class this morning. But look at um, verse uh, 4 for just a minute. It says, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, 
but also for the interests of others. And I was doing some study on that yesterday as I was looking through this, and I found out that the word interests here isn't really in the original Greek text. And it's put in there by the translators because they think that this is what the passage is talking about in terms of you know making it clear what Paul is saying here, that he's talking about interests. But he's not really talking about interests. Look at what he says. Uh, let's take that out and read it without the word interests in it. Let each of you look out not only for his own, but also for others. Now, if you just look at it like that, it makes perfectly good sense, doesn't it? And it really fits into the context of what we're talking about here this morning in getting outside of our own head and really not just thinking about our own things, but other people and what they experience and what they do and what they go through. We really need to put that in practice in our life. And so to give yourself away to others, you've got to stop focusing on yourself. But secondly, to give yourself away to others, you need to understand that you have something to offer others. And I am here to tell you this morning that you, yes, you have something to offer other people. Okay? Now look, you may, you may think, well, no, not me, you know, I don't really have anything to offer. Yes, you do. You have something to offer other people. And there is something that every single person in this room can offer other people. And if, if nothing more, you can offer them your love. And that in and of itself is of utmost value. Because that's what God offered us. That's what Christ offered us. And that's what we can offer others is our love. Now we really need to love other people. And, and God has made this the purpose of our life. All right, There's a great purpose statement in Matthew chapter 22 in verses 37 through 40 where Jesus says that the first and great commandment is this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so that's what it's about. That's what being a human is about. Loving God and loving others. So look, you have something to offer other people. And when you get into loving other people, you're going to find out there's all kinds of things that you can do to love other people and to really get involved in other people's lives. And that's great. And you know why you have something to offer other people? Because God has made you in His image. And He has so many things to offer us. And being made in the image of God, we have so many things to offer other people as well. And so we were created for love. It's the greatest thing that you can do in your life is to love others and you have something to offer other people. And you need to remember that on a daily basis. And when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you say, I am worth the blood of the Son of God and tell yourself how valuable you are and you need to do that because you are that valuable. You need to also say this to yourself, I have something to offer other people. And that is my love. And you can give them that love each and every day. And so in doing this, we make life about others instead of about self. Alright? Now look, I want you to read James chapter 1 and verse 27 with that in mind. Making life about others instead of about self. Okay? And what does James chapter 1 and verse 27 say? And we're all familiar with it. It says pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now when we understand that God has created us to love other people, when we understand that we don't need to be so much focused on our problems, when we understand that we need to make life about others instead of about self, we'll really be able to practice pure religion as God tells us to practice it here. 
to visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Because in practicing pure religion, we're really going to get out there and help others. We're really going to look at the lives of others. We're really going to try, strive to serve others as Jesus served others. We're really going to be foot washers as Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. And so we need to wash others' feet as well. And so make life about others instead of about self. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter 23. In verses 34 through 36, and then the lesson will be yours. Matthew chapter 23 and verses 34 through 36. And let's read these verses for just a moment. Matthew 23, starting in verse uh, 34. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. It's Matthew 25. Matthew 25, starting in verse 34 through 36. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to get five vocals, I think, before the year ends. So, it's okay to laugh at me. I, I, I should be laughed at for that. <laughs> anyway, so I can see better. Matthew 25, this is my pride, you see, that's getting in the way of me getting five vocals. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you can take that as a confession if you want to. Uh, <laughs> Matthew 25. Verses 34 through 36. Now it's about others. It's about helping others. It's about really getting out there and being involved in other people's lives. Now listen to what Jesus says. This is the day of judgment. He's got the, the, the goats on his left hand. He's got the sheep on his right hand, okay? So now he's talking to them and he's explaining to them why they are where they are at. Now look at what he says. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, those are the sheep, all right? Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited to me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Now think about that for just a minute. Because what he's saying there is he is describing a life that gives itself away to other people. He's describing a life that really is involved in the lives of others. He is describing a life that really does demonstrate the love of God. Now those are the kind of people that God wants us to be. And if we will give ourselves away to others, then we won't have so much time to focus upon our own problems. And we won't be discouraged nearly as much. And we'll be encouraged to go out there and to really help other people and really get involved within their lives. And so when Jesus says here, come, inherit the blessings, prepare my Father, and the people on the, on the right hand say, Lord, when did we do all these things to you that you said we did to you? And Jesus, His answer is simply this, because you did these things to other people, you did them to me. And what did they do? They fed the hungry. They gave water to the thirsty. They took in strangers. They gave clothes to those who were naked. They visited those who were in prison. All of those things are things that Jesus wants us to do. And all of those things have to do with getting outside of ourselves and helping others. And so, overcoming discouragement, if we want to overcome discouragement, the third thing we need to do is to give ourselves away to other people. So let's get out there this week 
And let's get involved in the lives of others and new teachers and new administrators. You're going to do a great job in getting involved in the lives of those students and that's going to be wonderful. And everybody else in the community, you get out there and you go and you help get involved in the lives of others. Get involved in the lives of those down in Louisiana who are suffering from that flood. Get involved in the lives of your friends and neighbors around you. Get involved in the lives of your community. Go visit the widows and the orphans. Go out there and visit somebody in the prison. Whatever you can do, get involved in other people's lives and you will find the love of God well up inside you and you will be so encouraged to be out there and to be with it each and every day. And you know what? There won't be time for disappointment in your life. Get involved in other people's lives. And if you're not a Christian, you need to get involved in the life of Christ this very morning. Come to Him. Respond to His invitation to identify with Him. Get involved in His life so you can get involved in others' lives. And if you need to do that this morning, we invite you to come while we stand and sing the song of encouragement.